this meeting so that I can post it up on our Google Classroom later on if you ever want to come back to it and revisit some of the notes that I went over. Um, I'm going to be doing this for every meeting from now on so that if you miss a Zoom, it's not a huge deal. You'll be able to catch up with the video of me going over the notes that I'll make sure to post after every Zoom call. All right, so today we've got one of our, probably one of the body systems that's most familiar to you guys, but definitely one of the biggest ones we have in terms of size to go over. And that is going to be the digestive system. And so as always, if you hop on to our Google Classroom. You can get to the notes down here in the digestive system section. Uh, one thing that I wanted to point out to you guys that I'm doing to make it a little bit easier for you guys to find these Zoom recordings that I'm taking is I made a new section on our classroom up here labeled simply Zoom meeting recordings. And so this is where I'll be posting all of our recorded Zoom meetings and notes that we go over over the course of the week. So it's in one easy place for you guys to find later on. Um, as you can see, I have a blank spot where our notes from today will go once I get them uploaded. All right, so jumping into the digestive system notes. And again, if you ever have any questions about anything as we are going along, um, feel free to unmute yourself and just ask, even if I'm in the middle of talking, or you can put them in the chat and I'll try to check that periodically. All right, just making sure that I got my screen on the right place because sometimes Zoom likes to switch it up for everybody. Oh my gosh. Okay, the digestive system. So everybody eats, right? We all know that we have to eat in order to stay alive. And digestion is the process by which we take the food that we eat and turn it into nutrients and energy for our, for our body. And so, it's this process of breaking down food into a form that your body can actually use, right? You can't just take a steak and like place it on top of yourself and absorb all the nutrients, right? You've got to break it down and you have to be able to get at the nutrients that are inside that food. So there's a couple different phases of digestion, a couple different steps that we go through. And we're going to kind of be following this process along as we go through the different organs of the system. So we're going to be kind of acting like food and track our path as we travel through the digestive pathway. So there's ingestion, actually taking in and eating the food, moving the through food out of your mouth and down into your stomach and intestines. Mechanical and chemical digestion, so using teeth and muscles to break up food, and also using stomach acid and saliva as well. Absorption, probably the most critical part of digestion, actually absorbing the nutrients that you're eating into your bloodstream, and elimination. So not all the food that you eat ends up as nutrients in your body. Some of it, if there's too much of one type of nutrient or if there's something we can't really break down, like fiber, we got to get rid of it. And that's where the elimination stage comes in. So before we start delving into the major organs that are part of digestion, I want to go over the two kind of main types of digestion. We have mechanical digestion, which is physically tearing and breaking apart food. So things like chewing, what our buddy the giraffe is doing over here, tearing apart using your teeth, grinding it using like those molars at the back of your mouth, 
mashing it. So using your tongue and your teeth to mash everything together. This also happens in your stomach too. Your stomach mushes and mashes your food all around. And mixing. So these are all different ways of physically breaking down, breaking apart, grinding out the nutrients from our food. So this is how we get the initial part of our food from the big solid form that we put in our mouth down to the tiny little nutrients that we can absorb. A lot of times though, we need something extra going on. We need chemical digestion as well. So this is things like enzymes in your stomach and intestines that start breaking apart the pieces of food down at like the molecular level. There's also stomach acid. So this really powerful acid in your stomach that breaks apart food by causing some of the different molecules of food to become separated from one another. And this is how we turn food into big solid chunks that we eat into tiny little microscopic nutrients that enter our blood through mechanical digestion, physically tearing and ripping apart the food, and then also chemical digestion, breaking down the food using chemicals like acids and enzymes. So here is kind of our total digestion system track over here. We come in through the mouth and then go through this big long tube of the stomach and the intestines until we come out the other end down here. This is called the GI tract. So whenever you hear like in a medical show or something, they'll talk about the GI tract or GI problems. They're talking about your digestive system. So this is basically a tube that goes through your body, right? It's one big long stretched out tube that essentially connects your mouth up top to your anus down here at the bottom. So the food directly travels from organ to organ as it goes through these tubes, right? It doesn't need to be like go across any membranes or anything. It literally just gets passed on from your mouth to your throat, to your stomach, to your small intestine, to your large intestine. It travels one way, right? In through all of this circuitry down here and then out. So there are a whole bunch of different structures that we're going to go over today, including the mouth, the esophagus, the stomach, and the intestines. Those are kind of the major ones that we're going to focus on with talking about a couple of these kind of smaller pieces. So this is your GI tract. This is where your food actually physically travels through as it's going through your there's another set of organs that we're gonna talk about at the end of the um, notes today. Things like your liver up here and your pancreas down here that don't actually touch the food. So the food doesn't go through those organs, but they still play a role in digestion as well. And we'll talk about those kind of at the end when we're getting ready to wrap up today. All right, so we're starting with where the food goes in, up here at the mouth. So as you might expect, the mouth is used for things like breaking up your food, moistening your food with your saliva before it travels down your throat. It helps kill some of the germs that might be on that food. So let's talk about the mouth a little bit more in depth. So, as you'd probably expect, we have mechanical digestion going on in the mouth. So this is where most of the mechanical digestion happens, right? These teeth, all these big teeth up here are biting and grinding and mashing and scraping to get your food down into more manageable pieces. But something you might not consider is that there's also chemical digestion that goes on as well. So not only are your teeth mechanically tearing and scraping apart your food, you also have saliva in your mouth, right? You got a lot of spit sitting around in there. Not only does your saliva help to moisten the food and make it pass down your throat easier, it also contains an enzyme called amylase. And 
amylase is what starts breaking down starch. So things like bread, crackers, stuff like that, those actually start to be chemically broken down inside your mouth as well. So that's why we say there's a little bit of chemical digestion going on inside there because your saliva is doing some of that breakdown. This is why, I don't know if you guys remember way back in like elementary school, if you ever did the science experiment where you took like a saltine cracker, which normally tastes pretty salty, right? Hence the name. And you put it in your mouth and you just let it sit on your tongue for a couple minutes without chewing it and just let it get dissolved and be all mushy. And it'll start to taste a little bit sweet. That's because your saliva and the amylase in your saliva is breaking down those starch molecules into their smaller versions, which are sugar molecules, which taste a little bit sweet on your tongue. So this food's been in your mouth. It's been torn up by your teeth. Starches are being broken down by amylase. And now it's time to swallow. And here is where the body faces a very important decision because it really, really wants your food to go down your esophagus or your food hole, your food tube, and not your trachea, which is your airway, because food and your lungs make a very bad combination. So on these diagrams right here, this little greenish looking thing is the food. And then the front part of the throat right here is your trachea. This is your airway that goes to your lungs. Food in here, very bad. Don't want that to happen. Over here is your esophagus. This is where the food is supposed to go in order to go down in your stomach. So the way that your body prevents your food from going down into your throat and causing all sorts of havoc on your lungs is this little flap guy right here called the epiglottis. So the epiglottis when it's up like this, it lets air get into the trachea right here. So when you're just normally breathing, your epiglottis is facing up and you can breathe in and out normally. When you go to swallow something, so this food starts going down your throat, as soon as you start swallowing, your epiglottis flaps closed and cuts off your trachea right here. Therefore, the only way that your food can go down is through your esophagus, this tube that'll take it down into your stomach over here. This is why you can't breathe and swallow at the same time. If you start inhaling and then go to swallow something, you can't keep inhaling because this epiglottis has closed off your airway. This is why if you ever get like a little bit of water or spit or something that gets behind this epiglottis, gets by before the epiglottis can close, you start coughing and choking really bad because your body is saying, oh, no, no, that's going to the lungs. That's bad. Out, 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 out. And tries to push it back out and down into your stomach. So this is something that helps to protect your lungs from being damaged by water and food, which are not supposed to be there. And it makes sure that the food goes down into the stomach, which is where it's supposed to go anyways. So when you're swallowing, your food has to go through your esophagus, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And it doesn't just drop down into your stomach, right? If you swallow like I don't know, a grape or something, it's not like it just falls down the well and lands in your stomach. Because your esophagus has got all these muscles closing in on either side. So instead, what we have to do to get the food to move all the way down is something called peristalsis. So peristalsis is these sort of like wave-like motions of the muscle in your digestive tract. And so this piece of food gets kind of slowly pushed down the tract through this peristalsis. This is what helps to move the food down through your esophagus and into your stomach. And also it helps move it from your stomach to your small intestine and to your large intestine. So these waves of muscles, this peristalsis, helps to slowly push the food down the esophagus and it ends up in the stomach, which is where it wants to go anyways.
So your esophagus, this guy in green right over here, literally all it is is a tube made out of muscle. It has some mucus in it to, again, kind of help coat the food and get it ready to pass through into the stomach. And it moves the food from your throat up at the top to your stomach down at the bottom. So when people talk about getting heartburn, right, they feel like your chest is kind of on fire. That's what happens when some of your stomach acid accidentally goes up your esophagus a little bit. That's also why it like burns a lot if you ever get really sick and you're nauseous and you throw up because your stomach acid is traveling up and through your esophagus, which is not a place that it is supposed to be in. But that's about all the esophagus does. It doesn't break down any food. It doesn't absorb any nutrients. It's literally just a tube from the top to the bottom. All right. So again, talking about the different types of digestion when we're breaking stuff down, as we move into the stomach, it's good to keep these types of digestion back in mind. So if you remember chewing, that's all teen, so breaking something up with your teeth, that's mechanical digestion, physically separating the food particles apart from each other by tearing and grinding. The saliva in your mouth breaking down the starch molecules is chemical digestion. So there's a chemical reaction going on between the enzymes in your saliva and the starch molecules in your food. Using your tongue to physically move around and break apart a piece of hamburger, that's mechanical digestion. And then stomach enzymes breaking apart that hamburger into its nutrients, that is our chemical. The reason that I wanted to go over those again before we jump into the stomach, this guy right down here, this kind of J-shaped sac right here, is because just like our mouth, our stomach actually does both types of digestion. So the stomach is essentially the final place for food storage and breakup. So the stomach's known, especially for having stomach acid, also known as these gastric juices. So these will break down food and chemically separate the food apart into its different molecules. The stomach also is covered in muscle, just like the esophagus is. So the stomach, not only does it use these juices to break apart food, it also can kind of squish and mush things back and forth a little bit. So these muscles in your stomach, they're not muscles that you can control on your own. Um, so you can't force your stomach to expand and contract. Um, they're called involuntary muscles. And we'll get to that more when we talk about the muscular system. But our stomach can mush food together and expand and contract a little bit to do a little bit more mechanical digestion. Um, but Chemical digestion is one of is pretty much the main thing that the stomach does. So it does a little bit of mechanical mushing and a lot of chemical breakdown. So again, here's our stomach right here at kind of the top of our overall abdominal area. So it stores the food and processes it a little bit more before it passes it on to the next organ in the chain. Like I mentioned, we have these digestive gastric juices that contain all sorts of different enzymes that'll help to break down the food chemically into its individual nutrients. There's also really strong stomach acid, which not only helps with this chemical breakdown, but also it can kill some of the bacteria that are coming in on your food. So your stomach is a very inhospitable place for bacteria to be, at least foreign bacteria that are bad for you. So the stomach acid helps to get rid of some of that bad bacteria and make sure that your food um, doesn't have too much 
contamination in it. So your stomach is pretty flexible, right? Even, we've all been there after like a big Thanksgiving meal or Christmas meal where you thought you were pretty full, but then that apple pie comes out and you're like, okay, I'm pretty sure I can at least fit that little piece of pie in here. That's because our stomach is flexible. It can expand out to fit almost two liters worth of food, two liters of volume. It's a super strong acid, like we said, which helps with killing bacteria. And it uses all sorts of different enzymes, like pepsin, for example, is one of the major stomach enzyme, to break down different things in our food, like proteins. So here's kind of what our stomach wall looks like right here. And then these little pits are where all of these enzymes and gastric juices are stored until the food starts to move into the stomach, which sends a signal to start releasing all of this acid and enzymes. So some things that people wonder about sometimes is that if the stomach is so acidic and it has all of these enzymes that are meant to break down food cells, why doesn't the stomach digest itself? What stops the stomach from breaking down its own cells? What happens is that there's a special mucus on the inside of your stomach lining. Not exactly like the stuff that's in your nose, but a little bit similar. And that helps to actually protect your stomach cells. So when the mucus covering is over them, your stomach cells aren't affected by the strong acids and the enzymes that your stomach is producing. So it coats, it has this protective coating that prevents all this really harsh chemicals from irritating your stomach too much. All right, so once your food has been mushed and smashed and chemically broken down in your stomach, it gets moved on to the small intestine. And this guy is kind of like the major powerhouse player of the digestive system. So even though it's the small intestine, it's really the long intestine. It kind of sits right in the middle of your gut down here and consists of this super long back and forth tube. So a small, your small intestine inside your body reaches to about seven meters long, which is a little over 20 feet long. So you have 20 feet worth of tube all mushed up and wrapped around each other and shoved right into your abdomen down in there. So the inside of your intestines has these little kind of finger-like projections called villi that we'll talk about more in a second, which are super important for absorbing nutrients. And then each one of these villi is covered in these tiny kind of extensions called microvilli, which further increase the area that we have the small intestine for absorbing. So the way that the small intestine absorbs the nutrients that get passed to it is by they come in contact with the small intestine wall and then get sucked up and transferred to your bloodstream. So the more area, the more liquid that the small intestine is able to touch with these villi and microvilli, the more nutrients it's able to absorb and the more efficient it's able to be in getting all the nutrients out of your food and into your body. So here, if here's our small intestine tube right here, it's made up of these kind of wavy segments and each one of these waves is covered in villi. So this is what the villi look like. It's kind of like, I like to think about it, how if you look at the carpet on your floor, right? Carpet is not one solid piece of fabric. It's one large area that has all sorts of little fibers poking up out of it, right? That's kind of like what the villi are doing. They are billions and billions of these tiny fibers sticking out of the wall of the intestine 
in order to capture those food. So here's one villi right here. You can see these villi are filled with blood. That's what this red and blue stuff is on the inside of them because the villi take the nutrients from your food and transfer it directly to your bloodstream in here. So the cells of these villi have their own tiny, tiny little, like these would be like tiny hairs sticking out of the fibers of the carpet. And these are the micro villi. So they're tiny little kind of extensions of the cell that essentially make even more area for nutrients to pass through so that they can grab those nutrients and bring them into your bloodstream. So we've got millions and millions of these villi lining every single meter of your small intestine. And then each one of those villi is covered in thousands of these tiny, tiny, tiny little microvilli. So that's why the small intestine is so important, is it's the main player in getting the nutrients out of your digestive system and into all the other systems So the nutrients that we are breaking apart from our food in our mouth and our stomach then go through our intestines and get absorbed by the small intestine wall, and go into our bloodstream right here. So a lot of the water that you drink gets ingested here um, and absorbs the important vitamins that come out of your food minerals, things like calcium and zinc and iron. And then the major nutrients like carbs, proteins, and lipids, which are fat, and which we'll be talking a whole lot more about for our notes on Thursday. The small intestine does a little bit of digesting itself. So most of the food that comes into your small intestine has already been really thoroughly digested and broken down, but there might be a couple pieces left that still are clumped together. And so the small intestine does have some chemical digestive abilities. So it is able to break down our food chemically a little bit with its enzymes. All right, um, so this slide just kind of reviews a lot of stuff we talked about. It does a little bit of chemical digestion, but the main focus of the small intestine is the absorption factor, absorbing all of those nutrients that we're getting. So we have over six to seven meters of tube that has over 300 square meters of surface area. So all of those villi and microvilli combined, if you took each one and completely flattened it out, you'd be able to cover the size of a tennis court, just about, just through all of the lining in your small intestine. Um, we can break down the small intestine into kind of three sections, depending on where we are in there. The one that I want you guys to focus the most on is called the duodenum sometimes referred to as the duodenum. So that's the first part of our small intestine here, basically right where the stomach and the small intestine meet. That is the duodenum. And so this is where that kind of, some of those final steps of digestion are happening in our intestine. The jejunum is sort of the middle part, and then the ileum is the end part, they both kind of do the same thing. It's mostly just more absorbing of nutrients and water through there. Um, but again, the one that we're gonna come back to in a little bit and really focus on is the duodenum, this very first part right here where it connects the stomach. So make sure to keep that one in mind, the duodenum of the small intestine. So again, this is where our, so our small intestine is in pink right here, and then our stomach is in brown. And so this is where not only the stomach connects to the intestine, but this is also where we get digestive juices from some of the other organs of the digestive system that we're going to talk about a little bit later. The liver, 
the gallbladder, and the pancreas, they all dump their digestive juices into the duodenum of the small intestine, into this first section here. So they all kind of feed in to this tube that connects them all, which goes right into the beginning of our small intestine, the duodenum, right here. So we'll talk about these guys in a lot more detail um, towards the end of the notes today. All right, so we finished going through the small intestine. We've absorbed almost all the nutrients that we can pull out of there. And so all that's left to do is travel through our large intestine. So ironically enough, the large intestine is a lot shorter than our small intestine. It doesn't do all of this zigzag back and forth stuff. It basically just kind of makes a loop around the outside of our small intestine. It's called the large intestine because it's a lot wider than our small intestine. It's a lot larger tube, essentially. So instead of being 20 feet long, it's only about five feet long. This is basically the final area for absorption. So anything that the small intestine missed, any nutrients that might still be hanging around, the large intestine is where we hope that we're gonna pick some of those up. So stuff travels through the large intestine. We have our final absorption phases, and then it ends right at the rectum at the very end. And so this is where your feces, so your poop, gets held here before it gets expelled out of your anus whenever you go to the bathroom. And so your feces is essentially all the stuff that is left over that either your body doesn't need to absorb right now or physically cannot break down. So sometimes if like we eat a lot of fiber or vegetables that have a lot of starchy sections, there are some vegetable structures that our body can't process, it can't break. So they'll go through the stomach and the small intestine without really having anything done to them. And then they're packaged up in a waste form in our large intestine. So like I said, the large intestine is mainly kind of the leftovers, the final solid material that we're still dealing with. So stuff that we can't digest, stuff that we don't really need, that's just gonna pass through us, it'll make its round through the large intestine. The large intestine is also our final stage of water absorption. So the large intestine is actually really, really important for absorbing water um, because obviously we're drinking a lot of water each day and our food has a lot of water in it as well. And so the large intestine is where we're hoping to recover a lot of that water that made it through the stomach And then finally, like I mentioned earlier, our ending point, the rectum here, is where all of that solid waste is stored up until it's ready to be excreted and exit the body when you go to the bathroom. So it essentially is sucking all the water that it can out of this undigestible material that's going through it. And it's concentrating all of that material instead of just being kind of loose and floating around, it's concentrating it all down into a more kind of shaped matter, more of a form instead of being too loose. So one of the ways that you're able to know if your digestive system is having problems, and specifically if your large intestine is having is based on how much water it absorbs through this process. So we use a lot of water from the inside of our body in order to digest our food, not just the water that we drink, but also the water in our body is used for digestion. And so the large intestine is where a lot of this water is reabsorbed. So it's where we're making sure that we're holding on to as much water as we possibly can. So there is a fine line between how much water the large intestine needs to absorb. And if we go too far in one direction or the other, 
that's where you start having stomach problems and bathroom problems. So if your large intestines are doing a bad job at absorbing the water, they're letting too much water pass through your system, that's when you have diarrhea. So there's too much water mixing with your solid waste that gives it that really gross watery consistency. That's because your large intestines are not doing their job of absorbing that water for you. Or sometimes they're doing too good of a job. So you're not getting enough of water in your system and your intestines are absorbing a lot of the water that maybe you could have used to pass things along more easily. And that's where we get things like constipation. So if too much water gets absorbed, all of a sudden your feces becomes really hard and rocky and it makes it a lot more difficult to pass. That's because your large intestine is pulling too much of that water out of that solid material. So we want there to be a balance where there's enough water where it can pass easily, but not too much water where it's not becoming forming a solid and we're getting rid of a lot of water when we go to the bathroom. All right, so before we go into our accessory organs, wanted to pause it there really quick. So that is all of the organs that our food is actually physically touching as it goes through our digestive system. So it goes in through your mouth, passes through your esophagus, down your throat, goes through your stomach, gets mushed up, goes through your small intestine where the nutrients get absorbed, and then goes through your large intestine where the water hopefully is getting absorbed and your solid waste is kind of being packed down. Any questions about any of these organs or their functions so far? Just curious, totally random question. Um, don't you have a, something in your lungs called a veoli that are just like vela, the alveolus, <laughs> or whatever they're called? That is a great question. So in your lungs, you have alveoli, which are different from the villi that are in your intestine. They're a little bit similar. The alveoli in your lungs are like these tiny little sacs, these tiny little bubbles that are where a lot of the gas exchange, so this, that's, those are the parts of your lungs that are super, super tiny and actually move the oxygen into your blood and the carbon dioxide out of your blood. We'll talk a lot about them when we get to the respiratory system in a week or so. The villi in your intestines are not so bubbles. Again, they kind of look like little fingers or little fibers that are sticking up. They're also important for exchange, but they're not doing gas exchange. They're doing nutrient exchange. So they're pulling nutrients out of your intestine and into your bloodstream. But yes, they do have very similar I've always names. Got names. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's the alveoli in your lungs and the villi in your intestines. Cool, thanks. Not yet, no problem. Good question. So the next part of the digestive system that we're gonna talk about is those organs that I mentioned a little bit earlier where your food does not go through these organs, right? The food is never actually gonna physically come into contact with these organs, but they still make enzymes and juices that are important for helping with digestion and absorption. And so since they're in the digestive system, but they don't actually touch the food, they get their own special name, which is the accessory organs. So the accessory organs, again, they are not part, whoops, they are not part of the path of food. So food is never gonna travel through the liver. It's never gonna go through the gallbladder. It's never gonna go through the pancreas. It'll go straight from the stomach, excuse me, 
from the stomach to the small intestine down here. But they still contribute to the digestive process. So if your stomach is right here, you have your pancreas, which kind of sits right behind it down here. You have your liver, which is, sits kind of on top of it and in front right up here. And then your gallbladder is this tiny little sac that hangs out underneath your liver. So your liver, this big multi-sectioned organ up here, it plays a lot of roles in your body. Probably the one it's most famous for is it helps to detoxify your blood, especially of things like alcohol. But for digestion, it's really important because it produces a chemical called bile. So bile is a really important chemical that helps break down fat. So fat that comes in through your food doesn't really get broken down well by the saliva in your mouth or the acid in your stomach. Instead, this bile produced by your liver is really what goes to town on breaking down Again, it also plays some other roles in your body, like filtering out toxins like drugs and alcohol. But in terms of digestion, bile is what it is super important for. So bile breaks up fats. It kind of surrounds the fats and breaks them apart into smaller and smaller pieces. And while the liver makes the bile, it also stores some of that bile in the gallbladder, which we'll talk about more in a second. But the gallbladder is essentially just this little storage pouch for the liver produced, for the bile, excuse me, produced by our liver right here. And then like I mentioned earlier, when food starts to move through the stomach and into the duodenum, that first part of the small intestine, that's what triggers the gallbladder and the liver to release this bile and dump it into the small intestine at this little point right here. So as a fun little kind of side fact, so while the liver is digesting a lot or detoxifying a lot of your blood, it also is collecting some of the dead blood cells that circulating around in your body. Some of these end up inside of the bile that then goes down and breaks down the fat. And then your large intestine will pull or will condense some of the bile with the undigested material. And the iron that was in your blood cells actually reacts with oxygen and rusts, which is the reason that your feces end up, ends up as this brown color is due to all of the iron and your red blood cells that are being caught up in your liver and then dumped with the bile into your digestive system and then clumped together into solid waste as it goes through your uh, large intestine. So if you ever wanted to know why your poop was brown, it's because of those dead red blood cells that the liver is collecting and then passing along in the bile. So yeah, the human body is full of all sorts of fun facts that we'll get to learn as we go through the next seven and a half weeks. So like I mentioned a little bit ago, the gallbladder is this tiny little pouch underneath the liver. And it's basically just a bile storage reserve so that even when we're not eating, the liver can still make bile and it has somewhere to store it. It doesn't just have to get rid of it. If you eat a diet that's really high in fats, it really um, can kind of deplete your supply of bile from the gallbladder. It can develop these gallstones, which can be painful potentially. And if you have too many of them, you may have to actually have your gallbladder surgically removed because they're causing too much of an issue in there. So you don't have to know the specifics of how bile works, 
but it looks kind of gross. So I wanted to make sure that you guys got a nice picture of it. So here is a actual picture from inside somebody's digestive system of bile, this kind of greenish yellowish liquid right here. Uh, so it's gross. It's very kind of nasty smelling. And when you're eating or when you eat some food that has a lot of fats, the bile, essentially these are sort of a cartoon of what a bio molecule looks like. They surround the big fat cells and kind of help pull it apart into smaller and smaller molecules of fats or also known as lipids. So the liver and the gallbladder are all about making and storing the bile in order to help break down the fats that we eat in our food. So the other major organ of the accessory organs that we're going to talk about is the pancreas, which is something that if you haven't heard of the pancreas before, you've probably heard of one of its main exports, insulin. So the pancreas is this little kind of leaf shaped organ that sits sort of behind the stomach. So if you remember from our anato anatomy terms, it is more dorsal to the stomach. So it's closer to your back compared to where the stomach is at. And the pancreas produces all sorts of helpful enzymes to help break down our food. So not only does the pancreas produce its own enzymes besides bile that help to break down fat, it also produces enzymes that break down proteins and more importantly, carbohydrates, which is where insulin comes into play. So blood sugar is affected by carbohydrates. So carbs, essentially when we break them down into their smallest molecule pieces, there are what are what's known as simple sugars. And so insulin, is what helps to control the release of sugar from your digestive system into your bloodstream. So insulin is most famous because people with diabetes have problems making and regulating their insulin levels. So the reason why people who have diabetes have to constantly be aware of their blood sugar is because something is wrong with their pancreas. Either if they have type one diabetes, the kind that you get are essentially born with, that means that your pan pancreas essentially does not produce insulin. It messed up somewhere and it's not able to produce its own insulin. If you have type two diabetes, that means that your pancreas can make insulin, but it doesn't do it at the right rates or the insulin that it makes isn't very good at its job of regulating the sugar in your blood compared to the sugar in your digestive system. So that's probably the most famous reason why people know about the pancreas and insulin, but it does a whole lot more than just regulate your blood sugar. So we have all sorts of protein and starch enzymes that are being released along with the stuff in the liver right into your intestine right here. The pancreas also, very importantly, contains things called buffers, which help to neutralize or cancel out the acid that you get from your stomach. So if you remember earlier, we were talking about how your stomach is coated in this mucus to help prevent it from digesting itself. It prevents it from being affected by all of those nasty enzymes and acid. Your intestines do not have this mucus covering. They're a lot more susceptible to damage from your stomach acid. So the pancreas right at the beginning of your intestine, your duodenum right here, it dumps in not only all these enzymes, but also these things called buffers, which help to neutralize your stomach acid. So the way that you measure acids is on what's called a pH scale, where one is super duper acidic and 14 is what's called basic. Um, so things like bleach and soap are very, very basic. 
whereas things like stomach acid are very, very acidic. Water is right in the middle of the pH scale at zero, or at seven, excuse me. And so this stomach acid, which is around a two pH, when it gets mixed with all these buffers from the small intestine, that helps bring the pH a lot closer to neutral. So up more towards like five or six, so only a tiny little bit acidic. So without these buffers, your intestine would be damaged every time the stomach moved food from the stomach into the intestine. So the pancreas helps to protect the rest of the intestine, as well as provide a whole bunch of important enzymes that help to break down proteins, starch, and other carbohydrates, and then regulate your blood sugar once those are breaking down. So those are our accessory organs. Our liver, which makes the bile, our gallbladder, which stores the bile, and our pancreas back here, which produces lots of important digestive enzymes and buffers to counteract the acid from the stomach. Again, the food never directly interacts with these organs. So the food goes straight from the stomach to the intestine. These guys just kind of mix all of their chemicals together and inject it into the small intestine where it'll then go to work on the food. But again, they're called accessory organs because they are not part of that gastrointestinal tract, that GI tube that runs from your mouth to your rectum and anus. They're on the side kind of playing a supporting role of adding in their extra chemicals and enzymes. So that's everything that you need to know about the digestive system and everything that'll help you with your assignments for today and tomorrow if you haven't done them. If you haven't done yours today, then these notes should help. So if we go back and look at what your upcoming assignments are, they're both directly about these parts of the digestive system we were just talking about. The first one is a labeling assignment. So if you fill it out on the Google form, it'll look something like this, where we have this dude with all of these different parts of his digestive system labeled with a letter. And all you have to do is go through and write down which letter that you think corresponds with the stomach. So essentially you just have to scroll up and be like, okay, which one of these is the stomach? Write down that letter. Which one of these points to the gallbladder? Write down that letter, et cetera, et cetera. So again, that's our assignment for today. So please make sure that you finish it up soon if you haven't done so already. And then starting at midnight tonight, I'll release our next assignment, which is sort of similar to today's assignment, only instead of there being pictures of the organs, you're gonna match the name of the organs to the description down here. So whatever those finger-like extensions in the intestine. We're gonna go up here, find which letter that describes those, and then write down that letter. One thing to note about these is that these choices will be, can be used more than once. So just because one of the answers is gallbladder does not mean that a future answer cannot also be gallbladder. So don't just cross out an answer once you use it, you might need it again. Also, I think there's one, maybe two of these descriptions down here that might have more than one answer. So like this one, I think number three right here asks for two regions where you can get mechanical digestion. And so if those two regions are, I'm just making this up, A and B, you would write down A and B for your answers. All right. So 
So pretty self-explanatory, but if you ever have any issues or questions with the assignments, you can always reach out and let me know. Uh, so before we finish up tonight, does anybody have any more digestive system questions? Anything that you're still a little bit confused about that you want me to go over again or explain one more time? Any questions about anything that we talked about here tonight? Check on the chat. Doesn't look like any questions in there. Well, if you do have any questions tonight or tomorrow, please reach out to me and I'll respond as soon as I am able. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording for this 